I got friends only wanna talk business. I got expensive, the wind is expensive. I got expensive, the wind is expensive. I've been reading all the work. And I've been shutting out the stars. Welcome to Put That Coffee Down, the freight sales show for freight closers. I'm Kevin Hill. I'm your host today, along with Richie Daigle. And we're going to talk about sales today. We're going to talk about automation, a lot of automation and intelligence. Huge. And it technology is, is the, the, the gasoline that makes automation run. It really is. I mean, if you're not using technology, you should, because that's going to make your life a lot easier. You can focus on the high value Revenue producing things and in sales instead of the, the lower value, you know, lower value mundane things that kind of eat up your time, you get distracted with. Oftentimes, a lot of salespeople like to, to focus on those things because you don't hear no as often, right? You can prepare, you can do a lot of preparation, you can make sure that everything's, you know, perfect, you know, and, and customized, and you waste a lot of time because it's low value. You're 100% right. You know, it, it's almost like uh, doing the dishes, right? It is. It's, it's therapeutic from time to time to just sit down and just wash some dishes. But we have dishwashers, and they allow you to wash a whole bunch of dishes quickly so that you can focus more on cooking <laughs> and taking care of people, right? So. You're exactly right. It, it's, it's, a, it's a great analogy, Richie. It, it is. It's like people will sit there and wash dishes over and over again instead of just throw them in the dishwasher. Just throw them in the dishwasher, get it done. Get on to revenue producing or value producing activities, right? Be intentional, right? And people, I mean, don't get me wrong. You need your space to let your mind unwind and be thoughtful and, and think and process. But be intentional about that time um, and, and do that accordingly. But understand that technology and automation can be there to open up more room for creativity, more room for applying yourself in a thoughtful and meaningful manner as opposed to being bound by all of this manual task sort of things. And if you do more automation, we'll show a video here later on where you can do really cool things. Yeah. If that's what you're focusing on and that's the, the high value generation, the attention factor of that. Uh, later on though, we have Omar Singh, uh, the, the co-founder and president of Surge Transportation here live with us. We're going to talk about APIs and RPAs. And I know a lot of people out there uh, don't understand the difference between, between those two. They're, they're both, you know, really good automation tools and, and data tools. And, you know, I understand APIs a little bit. RPGs, I'm still, you know. RPGs? Or RGAs. RGAs? RGAs, I'm sorry. I don't know RPGs, why I'm calling them RPGs. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. I, I, I don't know. I, that, that's how little I understand. Uh, so, so I'm going to get an education along with everybody else about automated languages. And, uh, and let's talk about Surge here. Surge Transportation is the fastest growing 3PL in the logistics space today. Based in Chicago and Jacksonville, they offer unrestricted uh, access to key markets. And sorry. Unrestricted access to almost all accounts, limitless territories, and a chance to be a key player in a growing company. To find out more, email jobs at searchtransportation.com. Sometimes the, the, my computer has a mind of its own and, and kind of moves around a, a little bit on there. That's the, that's the only problem with automation is when it doesn't automate. <laughs> <laughs> or automates the other way, right? It, it goes opposite of where you're, you're, you're trying to go. So it definitely is. So FreightWaves.com, we, we've been following this story very closely. We have an update coming out uh, right now, especially in the new newsletter. If you're not subscribed to the new newsletter at FreightWaves.com, to, to find the, the latest news uh, and information about the freight markets, uh, do it today. Go to FreightWaves.com, sign up for a newsletter. But we've been following this story about FedEx. And I think back on Friday, June 11th, we, uh, we heard the news that, from a tip, that FedEx had called or, or cut out 1,400 customers, 1,400 shippers that they do business with, and it turns out it's about 8% of the volume, the daily volume, and that was really in part because, or, or the majority of it, was because, well, you know, they just have too much demand, too much volume. 
so that the lower margin shippers, the low volume shippers that, that they work with, they gave them less than a business day's notice. So afternoon of Friday, June 11th, they said, your, your service is, is cut off. We will no longer pick up your freight, your, your LTL freight, this is FedEx ground. And uh, it created quite a bit of stir, right? And it turns out, you know, that they confirmed it, it showed the LTL, that the power was in the LTL's lap, right? That they had all this, oh, they have a lot of freight volumes, that they're, they're coming up with uh, rate increases, and it's just oftentimes too much that they can carry, especially for the, the profitability uh, of the business. But it turns out a lot of those low volume, low profitable customers, or that's what they categorize them as, we're suppliers to the large customers, right? The, the, the Home Depots, the Walmarts, the, the Amazons, uh, the, the, the Best Buys, all of those places. So, you know, big box retailers, all retailers, you know, everything is, is crazy in the supply chain right now. So a lot of those, the, those, those businesses are, you know, they have products sitting out on the ocean right now trying to get unloaded. They're, they're craving inventory, you know. Uh, Todd Maiden has a story out about inventory levels and how long that's going to take to rebuild into normal levels. Uh, so now it looks like FedEx is backtracking a little bit and not doing a blanket pull of those customers, but now being a little bit more strategic about it. Of course they are. You know, it, it, I love the, the quote that says that simple answers to complex questions are almost always wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's... When I read this story, I couldn't. I immediately went to uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, and I started thinking about the end of the movie when he gets his Christmas bonus, and it's the uh, the Jelly of the Month Club, you know. Yeah. And like that's that had to have been the feeling that these companies had reading that email, and you know, it's it's a it's a very complex thing: logistics, transportation, and the economy. And you know, logistics and the movement of goods and services is a fundamental vital organ of the economy. And when you're just cutting something off, even though it might look good immediately under a very, uh, you know, oh, what's the word I could think of here? But like a very narrow view, right? Mm -hmm. Of like, this makes sense if we only look at it through this little tunnel vision. But everything that you're avoiding is the complexity and how everything is interconnected. Um, and, you know, when you start impacting things at the bottom, the ramifications up are, are massive. You know, it, it's, it's almost like throwing some sort of nasty fertilizer in the grass and then you wonder why everyone's getting sick eating the beef that came from the cows eating that grass. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, you got to take care of the bottom in order for, for things to, to stay healthy up above. Yeah, so you always you always have to think strategically, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't know what who's connected to who. You don't, it's like a, a game of chess, right, Ricky, Richie? It's, yeah, you want to, you know, Oh look! I can take a queen now. I'm I'm big yeah, pieces yeah. up, and I didn't realize that that just set off this five move sequence that resulted in me losing the game. So my my momentary I made a good decision ends up being the very thing that is my downfall. It, it is it, it is, and this is automation. You, you know, automation is always about uh, calculating the next step, the next step next step. And it takes a lot of trial and error to, to figure that out and put a really good automation uh, automation process in place that you can use that's repeatable, that is going to cast a large enough net to, to, to make it really cruise control, but not too large that you lose your personality in there. You lose your marketing, you lose your brand in that. So, but it's a very good article. Uh, it just came out on FreightWaves.com. You can go and, and, and download that. Eric Kulish was the writer. Uh, also, Trucker Tools was, was acquired um, today. That announcement came out at 1030. And uh, that's uh, an automation platform as well. So, um, you know, big business in freight tech for, for automation and, and, and good data. So we'll see more of that as the months roll around here. So, but, but let's talk about automation. What should you automate and what should, should you not? Automate. Should you automate everything? No, the, the purpose of automation is to make people better, is to prop up and support your people. 
Mm -hmm. It's not to replace people. If you start replacing people, then your company doesn't have any personality, and that's a problem, right? You don't have critical thinking skills. You don't have the ability to problem solve on the fly, and, and those are crucial to success. But automation can allow for more space for people to be better at those things, and that's where you want your people doing. You want them problem solving, thinking, forming relationships, doing the things that make humans different than computers. And then you want computers and automation to do the things that computers and automations are good at so that you don't, you don't want a, a, your, your all-star salesperson just over there clicking buttons all day, right? That's exactly right. It's kind of what FedEx was trying to do. And so there's a lot of logic in that. You want to, you want to cut out the unproductive or automate the unproductive or not, maybe not unproductive, but, but the low volume, low margin, low revenue producing and, and automate those tasks to, to make people more productive in the, the high value tasks. And that's the, that, that's the yin and yang, that that's what you have to figure out. It, it, sometimes you can make mistakes like, uh, like, like FedEx has, but oftentimes uh, it, it's just, it, it, it's something that is hard for, for people to, to do. Yeah, and I think that with what FedEx was doing, and again, this is just my own take on things, but addressing, you know, you go back to the Pareto effect and you have your, your 80% and your 20%, and then by trying to address that, that segment of the business that is a, a, a pull, it's not producing enough profit and it's pulling a lot of resources, putting some focus and addressing that segment of the business, that makes sense, cutting it out that is a different thing. And I think that there's probably some nuance that needs to be put into place there. And there's probably a different strategy and more well thought out plan around what do we do with this to, to catch it up and move it forward versus just cutting it off and not realizing all the, the downstream effects that happen because of that. Mm -hmm. So what should you automate in sales? Now that's the, the real key question. You know, what, what are the things that, that are just ripe for, for automation, uh, whether that's a, you know, a computer program, or whether that's software, or whether that's just a, a process that simplifies things, though there's quite a few things that you can do. And the first one's a CRM, right? Oh, 100%. Right? You, you gotta have a CRM. You, know, you can automate your task and make sure that your tasks are being set up and on a, a, a cadence. You can automate follow-up schedules. You can automate email uh, reach outs and, and sending out value driven information, um, reminders, constant alerts and reminders of different things that need to be done. These are all things that can be set up and automated for you. Um, and it takes away you having to think about those things. It just, oh, boom, I got to do this. Let's go, mm -hmm. let's get it done. Um, and then beyond that, I mean, there's reach out, uh, there's a lot of kind of business development things that can be automated to a certain extent. Um, what are your thoughts? What, what would you add to that list? Yeah, you, you, you can schedule your follow-ups. You can schedule your contacts. You have that history of contacts too, right? Especially if you can integrate your email into your CRM. Then you go to that customer's name. You see all the, the past, uh, past communications with them, specifically in email. Then you have the call buttons and, and things like that. But the, those emails, and you can see who else in your organization has, has made those calls and, and, and get a really good sense of your entry point of how to frame your next contact with them. So I, mm -hmm. I think that is, is so important because a lot of times if you don't have that CRM, you're digging through different emails, you're trying to remember, you're going through your legal pad or your post-it notes, and uh, it can be, it, it's hard to, to get down and be laser focused when you have to dig through things each time you, you contact each different customer. Right or each different prospect, and try to piece together that history. Uh, it's just a, a time waste, and it, it's it's very difficult. And I would say uh, call recordings. Yeah, if, call, if you call can, recordings record, as well. Yeah. Rec record your call, and mm -hmm. and that does a number of things. It, it achieves you know there's coaching potential there. You can go review calls. Mm -hmm. It's like watching tape. You know when I was playing baseball, you know you go watch tape of yourself pitching. And there's things that you see on tape that you didn't feel that you were doing, right? Oh, yes, yeah, definitely. It's the same thing when you listen to a, a recording of, your, of, of a call. You're like, well, why did I say that? <laughs> you know, and the, these things come up. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, but you learn from that. But then in addition to those recordings, it's a great way to capture, uh, you know, it's like notes. 
right? You don't, I mean, you can take notes, but you can go back to the recording. You can just listen to what they said. And you, you know, if you have another call coming up, go listen to the previous couple recordings, get yourself familiarized with where the conversation is at so you can walk into the next call already in the flow of things, mm -hmm. you know, and are not tripping over your words or trying to remember where you left off and that sort of thing. And that's one of the, the, the most important things is, is watching that tape, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's painful. It's painful it's to, to watch your, your sales, <laughs> sales tape. It's painful to, to watching your, your show tapes. Uh, but but it, it really helps. It really helps because, you know, we're up here talking right now. We, we can't really evaluate how or what we're doing, what we're doing wrong, you, you have to sit down and, and watch the tape. You know, we're just going on a drilling right now. I heard a quote. Uh, it said, there's two types of people in the world, people that hate the sound of their own voice and Morgan Freeman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's exactly right. Those, those are the, the, the two times right there, uh, or the two kinds of people, definitely. Um, so lead generation is is number 2 on my list here. Lead generation, you know, you want to automate this as much as possible. You should know your target audience, right? You should know it anyway. You should know your buyer persona, your target audience. Though there shouldn't be any question about that. Yep. If you know that, you can automate it. Yep. You yep. can automate it. There's some some great tools to do that with, but but you should automate your lead generation process as much as possible. And you should be scientific about your automation, right? If you're sending out emails, Try different things, try different times, try short, try mid, you know, try an attachment, no attachment. You know, tr try a lot of, try things, experiment, and then calculate what happened, you know, look at the data on how those, those campaigns performed. What kind of open rates did you have? What kind of click rates did you have? What kind of reply, how many re people replied? Mm -hmm. And then say, okay, here's what we found that works, and now let's start sticking with that and then trying, you know, just building constantly building, constantly improving, trying different things. Yeah, I, th I think most uh, CRMs now and, and most email programs, they have where you can schedule emails. So you yep. don't have to, 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 to write it and then send it or, or hold it back or, or mm -hmm. do these other things. I, I know in Gmail, we, we use Gmail, and what I love is schedule emails. So mm -hmm. whenever I think about something, uh, and it could be after hours, it could be on a weekend, it, who knows, right? I, I can write that email and schedule it to send whenever I want to. And I, like right now at noon, I could write an email. I can write an email at noon. And I know that there's a lot of competition with emails around this time of day. And I don't want to get sucked into that competition. So I'll schedule it for 5 6 o'clock. Yep. Because then you have, you know, the volume of email coming into most people's boxes drops dramatically after hours, and, uh, and, and people will pay more attention to, to emails that, that they receive out of the busy parts of the day. And I know then, I do. And then you can identify, like, okay, I have this list, I have a lead list, and I'm going to try emails. And, okay, I have tried a number of sequences, and I have found that these people on the list have never responded or opened anything ever. That's mm -hmm. fine. We found out, like, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's information. You now know that mm -hmm. they probably have, they might have email inboxes that have 4,000 messages and they just don't check their inbox, right? So try something else. Try, try LinkedIn, try social media, try a phone call. You can say, these are the people that we're going to try, like, they're in my, I'm not going to email them list. I'm going to try another way to get in touch with them. So there's ways to always be learning with the information that you're getting. It's not just, oh, gosh, they won't answer the email. I'm just, uh, I guess they're not real humans. <laughs> I, I know, right? I, the, the, you pick up the phone, DM, you can find something, right? Yep, yep. You can find something, and sometimes you can automate those processes as well. Uh, that goes into prospecting, right? Yep. I mean, lead, lead generation, prospecting, kind, kind of uh, two sides of the same coin uh, because that, that's when you get into scheduling. That's when you can get into to, to programs that are just automated, you know, every three days. Uh, though there's nurturing campaigns, whether it's the, the cold side or people who have signed up for your marketing or to, for subscriptions to your services, uh, free trials, anything like that, you can then just uh, set it and forget it. Yeah, and, and the great thing here is that, you know, if you're managing a team, 
then chances are you might have figured out some of these things. You can share that information with all of the salespeople underneath you to say, hey, here's what we found that works. We're going to have these automation processes in place. We want you to use. You can equip your team with automation and technology by explaining to them what it does, how you're using it, what you found that works, and now you're, you're allowing them to focus on what they do best, right? And that's, that's uh, being a human. You know, automation and technology allows you to be a human more so than, uh, than, than without it. It really does. My LinkedIn finally came up, you know, talk about automation. But sometimes, you know, the, the internet's slow and it just doesn't come up. <laughs> but Rob Pussy, uh, hello, gentlemen. And uh, Morton, uh, Morton Uridia, good analogy. I think going back to uh, the dishwasher, you know, the dishes and dishwasher, you got to kind of really automate anything that you can, especially the things that you don't want to do, things that really don't generate money. It just sucks your time. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the foundational blocks of, of getting into that. So scheduling prospecting, I always use Calendly, Calendly right? It's, I think it's $10 a month. And I, I go back and forth too many times, or I have gone back and forth with people too many times. What, what time's good for you? What time's good for you? What time's good for you? Make I, it easy for folks. It's like, here's where I'm available. Pick a time and click. I know. I, I know a lot of people think that's, that's in, in, impersonal or off-putting a little bit, but I'd rather someone send me a calendar and I can just select what time I want. It's all automated, you know, the, the email invites go out um, because there's nothing worse than, you know, getting that meeting, you know, maybe on the phone call, you know, you're all piped up and now I got to do all this invite, right? Hey. I got to look for somebody's email. Oh. I got to, uh, to, to, to remember what time it was that they said and go and look and find that. Maybe it's written down somewhere and it, it really just derails you. Make it easy for people. You know, the, yep. ma make engaging with you as easy as possible, yep. right? And, and be mindful of their time and make it simple, right? If I can mm -hmm. send an email that says, just click on the time that works best for you, I am putting that person's time, I'm, I'm being considerate of their time, right? I'm going to make this as easy as possible. Here's a short email just asking you to schedule a time at what, here's where I'm available for the next two weeks, right? And don't be... Don't, don't feel weird about putting a whole bunch of times on there, right? Just, mm -hmm. hey, this is about you. Pick the time that works and, and let's, let's chat. Yeah, definitely. Templates. We'll finish it out here with templates. Email templates, call templates, oh. uh, you know, uh, proposal templates, right? You, you shouldn't be wasting a lot of time recreating the will each and every time you do something. You should customize it, but 80 to 90% of that email should be already crafted, already crafted, your value prop, you should know your value prop. If that email's not working, then you need to tweak it, change it, but find something that works, find something that gets open, find uh, you know, a phone script that gets people's attention, that gets you on the line, uh, that, that books that meeting or takes you to the next step and run with it. Always tweak it, make it a little bit better, make it a little bit better, but 80% of it should be done. You just kind of, you know, massage the edges of it, you know, make it really personal, uh, whatever it is, uh, and, and throw it out there. And proposals, right? Proposals, you should be changing ch names, addresses, maybe a couple of terms here and there, the price. Yeah, that's it. And, you know, I'll say that you, you hit the nail on the head with tweak it, right? Mm -hmm. And when you find yourself editing the same template or proposal the same way numerous times, Save a new one. Yeah. Take that edited version and have that be template 2.0. Uh, you know, so it's you constantly improve it, build upon it, and you want your templates and your proposals to be living documents that are constantly being improved upon and building and getting better and better and better. You don't want them to stay stagnant. Mm -hmm. You want to use them, you want to edit them, but you always want to be building on them as well. You do. You, you definitely do. So with that, let's, uh, let's welcome Omar to the, the, the show and talk a little bit more about APIs and RPAs, right? RPAs. Isn't it RPAs, Omar? Yeah, hey guys. Uh, nice to see you again. Thanks for having me today. Uh, yeah, RPA is robotic process automation. So I, I always say it wrong. I, I don't know why, 
but but I always do. Well, you had me concerned. You said RPG, and I was like, I think that's rocket propelled grenades. Yeah, so that's I a think different it's some type weapon. of automation. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of is an automation in its own right. But uh, thank you so much, Omar, uh, co-founder and president of, of Surge. Uh, for those in our audience and our viewers that that aren't familiar with you or Surge, can you give us a little bit of background? So Surge is our two primary offices are Jacksonville, Florida, and Chicago, growing very quickly in, um, in Chicago. We focus full truckload brokerage, and we really focus, our company was founded on the strategy of providing capacity for shippers when their primaries can't. So if it's short lead time, peak season, holidays, just tight market, and we strategically place ourselves sort of you know, in that space where we're saying, okay, we're going to be here when primaries can't rather than competing for that space. And in order to pull that off, we have to, you know, be really good at, at service and, and, and pricing. Um, and, and we do, it's, it's a model that works. Um, came up with it in 2011 after going out of business and realizing that selling on price, um, wasn't very favorable for me. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, so, so that's a little bit about uh, the company. We're growing really quickly, and and you know a little bit of the topic on the second half here is uh, a lot of the growth we're seeing now is a result of of some form of automation or another by being able to either deliver prices or secure capacity, you know, in a faster way than we traditionally used to. So, yeah. yeah so I think you're leading straight into my question for you, Omar. Is you know with that business model with being focused on capturing that that freight that's falling to the spot those peak seasons and going after the difficulties you have to be fast and your team has to be nimble how are you leveraging automation uh to enable your team to be so successful at what you all do well you know there's i think for us there there's two forms right there's the the thing that's the most popular right now which is pricing automation integration and partnerships with large shipper TMSs um, in terms of being able to provide prices either either when things are going into overflow and spot or just at the time loads are being created in their system, which is more of a real-time kind of living, breathing routing guide. Um, so on the customer side, it's, it's pricing. On the operation side, it's just automating a lot of these routine tasks, whether it's you know, benchmark rate adjustments, posting loads, things like you guys are talking about in CRMs, which aren't really complicated, but you don't want your star players just kind of doing the same thing all day long. Um, and then on the carrier side, you know, so kind of operations is inside the office, the carrier side, in terms of securing capacity, there's so much, uh, you know, sort of digital freight matching and capability of getting um, access to loads faster, whether it's after hours or just you know, one of the calls, one of the complaints I think that we get is we're tr we're growing so quickly. A lot of carriers say, well, I just can't get through, right? I would take more of your loads, but I can't get through. Just say, well, well, you don't have to get through. If you like it at the target rate, you can just, you know, log on and, and hit one of the book it now capabilities. Um, and that's, that's keeping the carrier reps. They're still busy because it's, calls are still queued up, but, um, but I mean, those are just some of the examples at a high level. You know, I try to kind of write and talk about these things in a way. Hopefully, that's kind of widely digestible. But um, yeah, yeah, it's always uh, about productivity and being as productive as you can. Technology helps us all do that that uh, tremendously. Well, let's uh, let's uh, you're the professor right now. Well, let's talk about R APIs and RPAs. Let's start with APIs and and break down the APIs with us what the term means, what you can do with it. And, uh, you know, it's based on your article that was published this morning at 10 a.m. here on FreightWaves.com. So you can always, anyone out there can go to FreightWaves.com, Omar Singh, Surge Transportation, and, and find this, this article. So uh, well, let's start with APIs. So AP, APIs, I think, and again, I'll try to just make this as widely as accessible as possible. But the way that I describe APIs when I talk to them is that you're working integrated within a system. So it's, it's automation, but you're, you're working 
inside in some form of partnership or, or, or ownership of your own TMS, and you're building a constant back and forth of whatever communication it is. And in, in, in our case, it's very largely rates right now that, that are APIs, but you know, a lot of um, EDI transaction sets and EDI as a form of systems being mm-hmm. c- connected and communicating are moving to, to API for the same sets, 204s, 210s, 214s. Um, but also, you know, we have now an API module in our TMS and, and we're starting to, to tie our rating tool in. We're starting to tie in business intelligence with Power BI. We're starting to tie in some of the RPA work. So, um, so I think that's the main part is you're working inside of a system that's, that's integrated maybe with many other systems, but rather from the outside. Um, if that, if that makes sense. And I think kind of almost any field in a system is, is an API field that you can communicate whatever you need to, if it's a date or a rate or a weight and things that run flags, revenue codes. I mean, it's just anything you want to map into decision-making. So So. you're kind of tying different data points and pulling them into a centralized system for, for employees, right? Yeah, well, and yeah. customers, yeah, for and employees. Yes, yeah. so vendors, yeah, for, you know, greater visibility throughout the, the, the process. Yeah, yeah, and decision-making and, and exchanging information, not just, um, you know, kind of, I guess sharing it one way. But, yeah, for employees, you know, we have our, at Surge, our first business intelligence director, and we're building business intelligence reports and tools and everything to, sh- to share with everyone. But of course, with with customers, it's rates, and with carriers, it's the all of the kind of digital freight matching book it now capabilities that are out there. They're all APIs. Um, so it's I, it's exciting times, and then you know I'm not going to lie, I'm pretty new to this stuff. So I've learned a lot in the last couple of years. And first it was APIs. Now I'm starting to learn about all of the capabilities with RPA. Um, but it, but but it's fun. It's exciting, and uh, you know it's helping us scale. So um, I know everybody during COVID is having trouble with um, either bringing people into the office or or talent acquisition. And so I think some of what we're doing in the past year has been just out of need. Like can't get people to you know I can't get people right now. It's hard. So um, so that's a little bit of the was the um, necessity is the mother of invention. You know, so yep. trying to figure out how to get things done. Yeah, when you, when you talk about APIs, you know, I'm, I'm always thinking in metaphors and analogies, <laughs> that sort of thing. But it, it, I think about them almost as ingredients, right? And you're, you're pulling each API data source is an ingredient. And you can pull this ingredient, you can pull this ingredient, you can mix this, mix this, and you can start blending things to bake and create some sort of end product, some sort of muffin or cookie or whatever it may be. Um, thinking in the same lines, like, is there a, a metaphor that you would have in mind for RPAs and how that how they differentiate a little bit from, from APIs and just trying to frame that, frame that difference, you know, for Kevin and myself <laughs> to, to better understand how these things work together and how they're different? Yeah. And I'm, and I'm learning too. trust me, I'm, like I said, I'm new to it, but so, so the way I sort of differentiate APIs and RPAs in the article is to say, uh, RPA is working outside of the system instead of the API, which is inside of it. But a lot of the logic we build around what the RPA is going to do is, is the same as the logic. It's just that maybe we're not integrated into that system. So I think of RPA as whatever you see on the screen happening with a mouse and keyboard can kind of be automated. So when we watch these demos of of the RPA processes that we're building, you know, it's saying, okay, now now the bot is logging into this system. Now the bot is going into the bidding portal. Now the bot is exporting that file and taking it to your uh, pricing, you know, uh, APIs. And now the bot is going into your TMS and recording what it does. Now the bot's going back into there and submitting the rate. So it's, it's in my mind, kind of the same ingredients as you describe them, um, but just getting them 
from the outside instead of from the inside. Um, and it's a little bit slower. I mean, uh, most of the stuff that we've built and that I've seen is uh, robotic automation is faster than a human, but it, it's definitely slower than API, just kind of, you know, automatic rate pulls and pushes to share that information within seconds. This kind of takes minutes. Yeah, would you say uh, RPAs are, are kind of the, the, the software version or the, the, the multi-platform uh, version of macros in, in Excel? Where you, you, you do step-by-step -step well, macro them. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we use them. And then, of course, you know, Microsoft's tools are, uh, you know, there's Power BI for the information, and then there's Power Automate. So it makes it a little bit more accessible where they try to say you don't really have to know how to write code they kind of help you through all these processes and integrations that exist. But um, yeah, I mean, it's part of, I mean, we're, we're using Excel and macros in terms of exporting information to send it into our system and then upload it back in. So mass uploads. So. What are you seeing, uh, you know, now that you're use, <clears throat> using API, using RPAs and, and using technology and, and increasing automation, what is that doing for your employees? Like, uh, what have been the results of that, uh, positive and negative? Well, I think for us, it's all positive. It's, it's like what you guys were saying, you know, just earlier in the show. You know, you you want your your key players doing, you know, what they like to do, what they're good at. Uh, hopefully, what either produces revenue or saves revenue. Uh, you know, you don't want them just doing these repetitive routine tasks that are just time consuming and i would go so far as to say quite frankly you know take some of the joy out of out of enjoying what you're good at right um and they're just tedious so i, I think from the employee side um this at least creating a little bit better uh you know experience where they don't have to do all of those things uh certainly have not um i would say and i know this came up earlier um cut back on on personnel, you know, you kind of, if if anything, if you completely automate something, then you repurpose and say, okay, now now let's learn this or do this, right? There hasn't been like, oh, now I have a bot that can do this, so you're not needed anymore. I mean, that that doesn't happen, you know, at least not with us, which is growing too much. Yeah, um, and, and, and APIs and RPAs, so they really feed into something I've been hearing for for years now in in transportation logistics, especially in freight brokerage. And you, you're talking, jog my memory. Uh, whenever you're talking about logging into this and logging logging into your TMS, logging into your CRM, logging into load boards, logging into the sonar, right? Uh, you, you're logging into a bunch of, of different applications all day long, and it, it does get tedious, right? I mean, because to do one task, you have to log into maybe three different three different platforms, right? And I, I've been hearing about one one screen solution for logistics for for quite a while we're doing a couple segments uh next week on our, our virtual summit the north american logistics tech summit and uh just from your point of view i mean is is are, are we seeing a move to, to one screen solution to where you're, you're booking loads you're quoting customers you're doing all the tasks of freight brokerage uh without having to to leave one screen are we getting closer to that i should say Oh, I, I hope so. I mean, I think that's the drive. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know there's a, a lot of uh, more like sort of collaborative platforms that are out there. Um, you know, some of them are integrated. I'm looking at, you know, different partnerships with like carrier sourcing tools. Uh, but I know there are TMSs that are designed to be a little bit more collaborative one screen that are kind of on the uh, on the quick rise, you know, replacing traditional TMSs that are designed for multiple screens. Like if I look in my office right now, I'm looking at four screens, right? Cause I can't, I can't get my work done if we don't have them. But uh, yeah, the demand is certainly there for one screen. And I think the people who are on the forefront of that are, they're probably gonna be really happy in a few years, you know? I think that they uh, they're, will. They're figuring it out. Yeah, they will. Um, a friend of ours, Nick Dangles, who was on the show last week, he about a year or so ago, uh, posted on LinkedIn asking this question, you know, I mean, uh, something about one screen solution. I can't remember the exact question, but the, the most common answer was buy more screens. <laughs> you know, that, that's the solution to it. The solution to have all these apps, 
Uh, m most, most people on that comment board was just, oh, buy another screen. How many photos yeah. have you seen of brokers that look like, you know, they're running mission control or something? And they have like just screens all I, up it, it is. It's like a badge of honor. It's, it's the more screens you have, the more successful you are a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the, the more of a That's freight broker you are. To think. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How many of those screens just have Facebook or YouTube up? I, I know, People right? People are distracted, you know. But, yeah. Not mine. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think that there's something there, though, because it's, you know, it's a different type of automation to start taking different solutions. So you can be meshing them together via API, or you can be meshing them together via one screen. But the whole idea is to take lots of data and start, when you start putting things together, you're making it more actionable. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're, you're quickening um, uh, the, the number of seconds. You know, you're, you're, you're carving off seconds from people being able to get the information they need to make decisions. And when you start saving five seconds here, it's the opposite of death by a thousand paper cuts, right? Mm -hmm. and, and now that's where your, your productivity starts picking up. Your employees are more satisfied because they feel more supported. Uh, and, and they get more done and, and they're not bogged down by all this menial stuff. Um, that's my thought, Omar, but you're, you're living it. So is that, am I, are we on point here? Is this what you're experiencing? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And by no means, like I said, do I want to say I'm the expert, but for my experience, yes, I think, you know, you're on point and yeah, if, if we can get everything into one place, we're, we're, we're way better off. Uh, and I was just thinking as you were saying that, like, not only is it four screens that we're looking at, but, you know, on each screen, you have multiple tabs going on, multiple different browsers and something's minimized, something's behind that screen. And then on, on, on my main one here in the middle, I have my chat and my email. So there's two things going on at all times there. And it's just, uh, yeah, whatever we can do to get that into a more controlled kind of visibility and, and, and maintenance, I think. I think it's there. I think people are making a lot of strides doing it and it's going to be required, you know, before long. I, I, so. I think it is. It's just the process of getting there. And it's a very interesting process right now. You, you finished off your article talking about buy versus build. And that, that's something that I, I, I've looked into and, and followed kind of like the one screen solution. It's something that fascinates me because I, I can see where, you know, if you're, Five hundred million dollars above company, you basically you, you have to, to 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 build a customized version of what you need. APIs, RPAs, uh, especially the APIs, they, they really come in handy because you can pipe in a lot of, of data, so you don't have to build everything, but you have to build that that central nervous system uh, for your freight brokerage. So so you have that, uh, but each stage of your growth in a freight brokerage, you're your needs change drastically, right? That, that 50 million or 20 million needs or, or, or X, the 50 or Y, the um, 100 million and above is, 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 is some other alphabet, right? It is what, what you need right now. So you, you kind of have to, you, you have to decide whether you want to buy or build uh, systems. But then, you, oftentimes, it's, it's better just to start over than to build off of those legacy decisions that you made in the past. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I've seen both. And, and I say in the article, you know, until I started getting into having to build a little bit, I was always a big fan of buy. And I think that, that you're right, depending on the stage that somebody's in. I mean, even when we open for business, we got one of the monthly subscription TMSs because it's like, well, I, I don't know if this is going to work, right? So I don't yep. want to, you know, drop a whole bunch of money and then find out that I, I can't source a truck uh, and then go do something else. Um, so that was like kind of that first stage mm -hmm. for us of low level investment. Let me start learning about this and what's going on. And then when we made our kind of got through our proof of concepts and now, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of here to stay, let's invest and now buy something bigger. But, but you're right. I think, you know, everybody kind of has that experience and has to just, um, whatever the needs are at the time. Right. And then, so now, you know, we, we started building just on the, the pricing capabilities, but that's kind of, we built that right. But that using 
a lot of other tools, but um, but now we're within our TMS, have the API module, and so we're doing some some custom building within our TMS. But I think for the most part, there's so many products out there. There's so many things that integrate with, like I said, Power BI and Power Automate, and there's so many people in freight tech now that are offering these automated solutions to either different TMSs or different tasks, or like you guys were saying, you know, different CRMs that are giving automated solutions to the sales cycle and process. Um, I think whatever people can do, you know, I will say whatever works for you, you have to do what works for you in different sizes. But um, historically a fan of buy, but now we're doing some building and I'm, I'm having fun with it. Um, so, so I guess that's lucky for me, but uh, historically I've been a buy guy. Uh, it's, but yeah, so it's both now. I, I think the future is a combination of both, buying and building as you, as you go. You just don't want to get in the, that spot where you, you have legacy system over legacy, you know, new patches to where you're not going to be able to do the next thing because right. you know, you're dragged down on a, a lot of bad technology that doesn't work well with each other. And uh, that, I think that slows down a lot of people because they just can't, I mean, it's a huge risk too. Yeah, you basically have to scrap everything you've ever done and yeah. institute something new, which is scary for, for anybody really. Yeah, or I've seen larger companies, you know, they acquire a different company for their technology, but then they never really figure out how to integrate it into their legacy mm -hmm. platform. You go, you know, well, now this is an add-on module. Okay, we have this other add-on module. You have different credentials for all of the modules and they don't really talk, but somehow or another you figure out a way to kind of make it work but it never works the way it's supposed to when you just do that piecemeal you know so or not never but maybe not all the time so <laughs> kind of makes me it kind of makes me feel like it's almost order of operation sometimes you can buy to to develop your foundation and baseline that you can then build upon um but yeah i've definitely been part of a CRM migration of information, mm -hmm. all the history and everything from one over to another system. And that's, that's not a fun process. <laughs> so, yeah, but, it's uh, terrifying. It's <laughs> terrifying. And yeah. then, and anytime we do that, I like, I still keep the old one just in case I have to go back and in case something didn't come over, you know? Yeah. But, um, oh, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm bad about that. So you get used to figuring out how to make something that doesn't work well, like work for you. And you still kind of don't let go. Yeah, I did a migration once of Outlook to, to Gmail. And that took like six days. I, I did something wrong, of course. So <laughs> I, it, it just it just scares me it, anyway. But you, know, you have to do it. And you have to, to find the right people who can, uh, who can do it for you, definitely. Omar, uh, before we leave, uh, what's your thoughts on the, the second half for trucking, the spot market, uh, contract? What are we going to see? You know, I know that right now the reports came out that June was a little bit looser than, you know, analysts had expected. But, you know, I, I think things are going to still be accurate in the assessment that it's going to be tough getting through the second half of the year. You know, we're, we're going to about to experience Fourth of July and then so much pent up demand now that we're sort of um, uh, there's not going to be any right way to say it, but we're sort of exiting COVID, right? The vaccination rates are up. People are out. I was at the airport last weekend. And I mean, it's the start of summer, but I mean, the busiest airports. I went from Chicago to D.C. on 7 a.m. Saturday. I thought no one was going to be in the airport. Um, and it was the, the busiest nice. I've seen it, you know, in 15 months. And so now you're talking about food service coming back online, travel and concerts and sporting events and you know, construction and in terms of everything else that was already there. Um, I, I think that you know, things are going to stay tight and, uh, you know, and drivers left the market, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I see um, capacity being tight and, you know, I guess while we're at it, automation helping, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, in the second half and in the future. Cool. Cool. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's always great to have you on. We'll see you next month. Uh, how does our, our audience reach out and learn more about uh, Surge Transportation? Well, like anything, I mean, everything's on our website, whether, you know, whether it's jobs, customers, you know, career page. I mean, I think it, it's all there. I'm also just very accessible email info at Surge Transportation, and it'll get routed to the right person, including me. 
um, you know, and, and I'm often seen in our Chicago office in Jacksonville. So uh, okay. still do a lot of in-person interviews and hiring and training. So I enjoy being on the floor and, uh, you know, I enjoy this business. So I'm accessible and around. Awesome. Awesome. And if you're looking for a career, jobs at surgetransportation.com, certainly email yep. there and uh, check out your career board and, uh, and, and see what you can do. So thank you so much, Omar, and uh, All right. see you soon. Thanks, guys. Great to be here. All right. Bye. See you. Awesome. He's accessible. He's probably he accessible because of automation. It, exactly right. And RPAs. RPAs. So let's talk about automation. Let's talk about TMSs, right? So Thai TMS, right? That's a great automation tool. Uh, a lot of APIs. Thai TMS is the ultimate domestic 3PL solution for LTL and full truckload freight. Thai gives you a centralized platform for sourcing load coverage by connecting you to load boards, rate intelligence, and capacity tools on a single page. With Thai, you can automate your LTL shipments from quote to delivery and all the way through your accounting process. If you're a freight broker or 3PL trying to expand quickly, Thai offers unmatched speed and scalability. So you can check out Thai, and it is T-A-I. So great folks great. over there. Yeah. 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 Let's let's talk about Sonar. Let's talk about the the what you're watching in Sonar this week. Mm -hmm. What are you watching? Yes. Yeah. So watching, you know, big moving markets, markets that are shifting mm -hmm. suddenly and abruptly, uh, whether they're whether that be tightening or loosening. And you know, we do have some new data in Sonar that is. Uh, just like we were talking about, is condensing several data points into a singular data point to make it more mm -hmm. uh, actionable and easy to understand. Instead of looking at three lines on a chart, I can look at just one number or one line on a chart. You know, and so that's the the great thing about having data that is being you know having a data science team that is taking data and meshing things together to uh, provide a better picture or, or more clarity. You know, I was thinking that the uh, the anecdote to paralysis by analysis is focus. And if you can bring things into focus, then it, you can make more sense. And this is an example. You know, what you see in this first chart, uh, we're looking at Savannah, Georgia, uh, dry van. In the green line, you see outbound volumes for dry van are going up, they're surging, while inbound volumes in the orange line are staying flat or, you know, if mm. anything, trending down. And so you have this gap of more dry van freight leaving than is entering, and that could, creates a capacity constraint. And you see the reaction from carriers and rejections in blue. And of course, you know, this is, uh, you know, like, like seeing a hook echo and radar, you know, you know, signifying a tornado, right? This is, this is your perfect storm of, uh, you know, outbound volumes up, the gap between outbound and inbound volumes grows and rejections go mm -hmm. up and capacity is tight. But is there a way for us to tell this story uh, without having to, to rely on three different lines? Um, and that's what just came out in Sonar, uh, you know, I think it was just last week. Last brand, week brand, brand new capacity trend metrics. Um, and this is kind of a complicated, this is a big dashboard showing the whole view, but I have highlighted Savannah here where we can capture that exact scenario and environment in a singular score. And that's automation. Yeah, and so now, um, you know, instead of a, a broker that's making those fast-paced decisions, having to, well, let me look at what all of these metrics are doing for everything, or plug in, you know, I can just look at a score and see, oh, Savannah got tight, and now I have that information. That's all I really need to glean to be able to make the appropriate decisions and get out ahead of that and not be caught off guard. Uh, but yeah, this is just... Um, uh, a neat little page that was built out, uh, kind of highlighting the capacity trend, uh, you know, across the market. You see these red markets are markets that are tightening. The darker the red, uh, the, the tighter the conditions, you know, uh, week over week. And then uh, above, you see green markets where uh, conditions are loosening. And, mm -hmm. and so now you are taking a lot of different variables into the equation to get a, a more accurate and robust picture of, uh, of those conditions. And it is all about automation. It's all about condensing that, that decision time, right? Putting the information down where you can make a quick decision. And if you can do that, and that has a lot to do with the APIs, being able to see different pieces of information, it increases that decision maker, 
decision-making power and, and speed. And once you do that, once you start automating using templates, you're automating whatever you can, then you can focus on the, the really cool stuff in, in sales, like mm -hmm. making outrageous videos and, uh, and prospecting and, and going out and networking. And we have a video here of uh, Matt McClendon, um, who is a VP of Sustainability and Innovation at Covenant Transport, uh, doing a commercial for F3, the Future of Freight Festival, here in Chattanooga, November 8th through the 10th. So if you could roll that film right now. Cody? Hey, I want to give a quick plug to Freight Waves and the upcoming Future Freight Conference in November right here in, do my Vanna White here, Chattanooga, Tennessee. I'm on top of Lookout Mountain flying my hang glider right now. It's one of my favorite things to do. I'm a Lookout Mountain or Chattanooga resident. And if you come to Future of Freight, which you need to for all kinds of reasons, from incredible keynotes to great events to fantastic sessions, um, you need to come and stay a few days later or come a few days early. I know several friends of mine in the industry that do not live here that are bringing four or five, six members of their company to kind of have little offsite meetings at different places around town. Um, in one case, before the conference, in another case afterwards, but it is a great place to network. And as far as I'm concerned, a premier place to have a conference. Chicago's great, but come on, it's Chattanooga. This is the next big freight town. Come on, you guys know it, it's gonna happen. Chattanooga's where it's at, Freight Waves, Future of Freight. 2021 November, I think it's like six, seven, eight, eight, nine, ten. Look it up on the website. Um, obviously, my hands are a little full right now. I can't pull it up and look at it. Future Freight 2021. Craig Fuller and his team have done a great job putting together a great plan. Be there. So yeah, that's that's Matt. It's November eighth through the tenth. Out hang gliding on his weekends. Something I will never do. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought you were a hang glider. I do not like heights. Are, are you I not? ride my bike right by the hang gliding center oftentimes, and even just being on the road, I'm like, that's close enough. <laughs> that's close <laughs> enough. I'm good. I can't believe you, you'd never hang glide. No, hang gliding, yeah, just, just, like, just heights, I'm out. Can't do Aren't it. you a mountain biker? I am. I'm okay on a bike, but I don't do good. But, but that's you know, heights, right? Well, it's, you've got trees. <laughs> you know, I fall, I fall into trees. I don't do good on the trails out west where it's like, hey, if you fail here, it's 2,000 feet to think about it before you go splat. Like, no, I can't do it. I, I don't blame you. I can't do it either. I, so. I, I, really, <laughs> I really can't do it. Uh, I, I don't know. You but, know, I, I made it this long without uh, flying around and... You know, airplane, being in an airplane is, is enough for me. I have a lot of friends that, you know, 40th birthdays that they wanted to go skydiving. It's like, have fun. Have fun. <laughs> I will sit on the ground and, and have a, a, a beverage or two while you guys are, are I'll be relaxing. <laughs> I'll, I'll be relaxing, you know, with my feet on the ground. So, but, but no, it's, it's a great commercial. And, and really, I mean, if you can automate, if you can get, get, get a system process up and running, you can do more cool things like that, you know? That brain power, that brain power goes to creativity instead of remember your, all your, your logins and passwords. Exactly, just try to, try to create as much time, you know? And uh, that's, that's the beauty of automation is it, it does open up time for you. Yeah, yeah. And, and Matt is uh, speaking with our own, very own Danny Gomez about how technology is driving uh, zero carbon, sustainability in the supply chain. That's coming up June 30th, which is a week from tomorrow. We have a, a great day of sessions for that North American Logistics Tech Summit uh, coming up. I just uh, did an interview with Joel Klum over at Worldwide Express um, talking about, about technology, talking about the SMB market, the small and medium sized uh, mm -hmm. shippers that the kind of FedEx has had a, an issue with over the last couple of weeks, but we, we talked about that. We talked about technology. We talked about buying and building, you know, or buying versus building, or buying and building. And we talked a little bit about their big news, uh, the the merger of equals between Worldwide Express and Global Trans, which will be a, a brokerage juggernaut uh, going into the future. So. It's a, it's a great session. Uh, Chrissy Montgomery from Kinco is talking about warehousing logistics or warehousing technology and mm -hmm. logistics uh, that's coming in. Uh, Ryder will be with us as well. Uh, Convoy about you know uh, freight brokerage and logistics becoming more of a of a of a product. Mm -hmm. 
as opposed to a service. And we have a number of really great sessions. You can check that out on live.freightwaves.com. The full agenda will be there, speakers as well. Uh, but that wraps it up for another Put That Coffee Down. We'll see you live again next Tuesday at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. I got friends, only want to talk business. I got expensive, because when is expensive. I got expensive, because when is expensive. I've been getting out of work. And I've been shutting out the stars.